You've reached Conversations with Mr. A. This is your host, Anthony Apostilla. Thank you for listening. Let's get right to the episode. Welcome to this edition of Conversations with Mr. A. This is your host, Anthony Abastilla. So for this edition, it is my pleasure to have from the Washington Youth Academy, Commandant Chris Acuna. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Acuna, for being here. Thank you very much for having me. It's my pleasure. So uh, Commandant, uh, can you explain to me a little bit what the Washington Youth Academy is all about? Well, since uh, 2019, we've actually incorporated the word challenge into the name of our program. So we're now known as the Washington Youth Challenge Academy. And we've done that so it aligns with the national program that we operate under. The National Guard Youth Challenge Program operates 40 programs in 28 states, Puerto Rico, and uh, the District of Columbia. How many programs total? What do you count? Uh, more 40. than 30? 40? And counting. Yeah. Woo! That's a lot. It is. That is a lot. Now, how connected uh, to the state and the National Guard is the Washington Youth uh, Challenge Academy? Sure. Uh, each program uh, operates under the leadership of the military departments within their respective states. The military departments are headed up by the senior military officer, the adjutant general of those states, and Washington is no different. Okay. Uh, can you uh, share with me a little bit about your uh, professional and military background? I can, but if I could just continue to elaborate on the previous question that you asked me. Go ahead. So the, the program is managed by the National Guard. It is a DOD-funded program managed by the National Guard, and as such, each military department within the participating states um, is, is the leadership component of the Youth Challenge Program. We... Uh, as an agency within the military department, answer directly to the adjutant general. Wow, wow. And so it, it sounds like a big uh, conglomerate. Am Absolutely. I right on that? Yep, you bet. And we really do rely heavily on the support of the, the command element of the National Guard and the military department. Um, they support us in terms of logistics and finance and human resources. Um, and then, of course, giving us that place um, among the other agencies within the milita military department serving our, our state because the military department is a cabinet seat uh, within the state government. So it's important that we represent our state a as an agency within the military department. I take it you've probably made a few trips to Olympia. We have. State we capital. Uh, since the pandemic, uh, we haven't been back, but I'm looking forward to returning to, to, to those traditions. Uh, since the program opened in January of 20, uh, 2009, we would bring the cadets to Olympia as part of the Responsible Citizenship Corps component where they learn about what, it, it, what the legislature's role is and how elected officials conduct business and serve, and serve the citizens of the state, uh, how the judicial process works. It's really a fascinating tour to go down to the Capitol and tour the grounds. Wow. Um, can you, now, a few episodes ago, I had uh, Gerald Lindsay do a podcast, and he shared his experience, but for our listeners out there, new listeners, can you explain how the Washington Youth Academy works for a, a student who wants to get in? Absolutely. So the Washington Youth Challenge Academy is a quasi-military life intervention program. Um, our mission is to inspire self-reliant, self-correcting behavior. Um, by providing a health, uh, safe, healthy, highly disciplined training environment for teenagers. Um, we no longer like to use the word at risk when we describe the students because many of them are behind. They need some guidance and help. And that in itself is a risk factor, but we don't like the, the sometimes the negative connotation that at risk can can be associated with. So we, we are open to all students, eligible students, 16 to 18 years of age within the state who need our assistance. So our target audience are those students in, in the greatest need. And they volunteer, they must volunteer 
It is a fully funded program. It doesn't cost the students or families anything to attend. It is funded by the uh, federal government, 75% with a 25% state match. Here in Washington, our students uh, earn high school credits, and um, they can earn up to eight while they're in residence. The program offers experiential learning as a way to, to provide an immersive environment where they are safe to try and learn and fail and succeed and grow. The program's uh, rooted in eight core component areas where they, they have to master and, and demonstrate proficiency. They include academic excellence, leadership and followership, physical fitness, service to the community, life coping skills, which are all important, Agreed. health and hygiene, responsible citizenship, and job skills. Wow. Um, so can you explain to our listeners uh, your role as a commandant and just working there? Can you explain uh, what you do at the academy? And you've been doing this for a number of years. I have. I've been with the program since 2009. Um, my job as the commandant is I supervise the residential operations. So that's all things cadet related, all of their training, all of the cadre staff, that's the uniformed men and women who are providing the 24-7 supervision to the cadets when they're in the residential phase. But it's much more than that. We, are, we represent the parent component in the, in the equation, right? We're there as teachers, as confidants, as mentors, as coaches, as disciplinarians. And we provide that structure, that consistent, firm, fair structure and approach meeting them where they need to be met, and inspiring self-reliant behavior, number one, by our example, but number two, and perhaps more importantly, through right relationships. Some of our kids come to us and, and have had struggles with building solid relationships. Some of them come from backgrounds where they've experienced trauma. Some of them have come from fine families that, and, and have been very fortunate to grow up with a two-parent household. No matter what, they all come to us with something in common, and that is they need a little help to learn how to follow through and do the things that they are responsible for doing. The cadre's role is, is so such a close connection with the cadets because we're there with them so long during the day. They're awake for 16 hours. They start their day at 0445 and they lay their heads down at 2045. That's 845 in the evening. And we're with them the whole time. So it's a really close relationship we have with them. 445 in the morning. It's pretty early. I, <laughs> wow. So what do they do when they get up at 445 in the morning? Well, the first thing they do is they begin to get ready for the day and make their beds. And the first thing we have on the training schedule every day is physical fitness. We know how important it is to live a healthy lifestyle. So our health and hygiene core component really dives deep into understanding the benefits of nutrition, understanding the benefits of, of healthy living habits, whether that's going to bed on, on a certain schedule or avoiding things that are harmful to the body, um, but also the benefits of physical fitness, feeling fit and knowing how that can set up your day and affect your attitude. Those are the kinds of feelings we want to have every day. And when we get a good workout in, it really makes the rest of the day go well. Awesome. Awesome. Um, well, what are some of the most rewarding and challenging aspects that you've experienced while working at the Washington Youth Academy? Oh, that's, that's a question I get asked a lot, and it's a question that always brings joy to my heart because I, I can't, at this point, I can't even begin to quantify how much this work feeds my soul. I literally have been blessed to find my life's work. And earlier you asked me about my background in the military and, and my background professionally when I wasn't in the military. And, and I think that ties into this question because I loved the military. I was in the United States Army. I really enjoyed my time there. I did not spend a career in the Army. I, I didn't retire. 
But the army and that experience and the fellowship and the struggles and the, the successes and the pride I felt by being in uniform and serving a greater cause than, than just my own really inspired me. It helped me to, to understand more about myself. And I, I learned that I wanted to work with people. My mother was a teacher. I worked in construction, working with people, building things, and I also found great joy working as an athletic coach. I coach and umpire baseball. And it was in, in those things that the one common element was, was the human component. And I love working with young people and helping them become better versions of themselves. So what's rewarding to me is to see them put their faith in what we have to do, even when it's a fearful step. They don't know us when they first get here. It's very stressful early on. The program is intensive. We don't have uh, cell phones and internet and, and uh, all kinds of recreational activities early on. They've got to earn some of those privileges. They've got to have skin in the game. And what's rewarding is when they start to realize how the structure and life skills and, and attention to detail begin to make them more capable, more confident, more efficient, and more accountable. I just find so much joy in watching them unfold and blossom in, in their true potential. What really is rewarding for me, the things that, that I reflect most fondly on, are when I am validated by the quality of the relationships we build, when the young men and women that we've served over the years go out and live their lives and choose to come back and work here on the staff. We've got cadre who are graduates of our program and I can't think of a better testimonial than that. I was so moved when the first cadre, uh, cadet graduate wanted to come back and, and I'm so proud that they want to continue doing this work. That's what really makes me keep coming back. That's awesome. I know just by listening so far to the interview, you're very passionate about your job and um, just about the Washington Youth Challenge Academy. Um, could you walk our listeners how a typical day would look like for sure. you? Well, right now we're uh, in week two, early part of week two of the acclimation phase. So in the first two weeks of the program, it's very regimental. We don't go to school. There's plenty of classroom learning in, in, incorporated into other activities like drill and ceremonies, learning how to march, military customs and courtesies. They're understanding the, the, the rank structure and the leadership structure and following our lead on their way to following their own lead. Um, there's a great deal of other introductory learning going on, everything from nutrition, like I said before, to um, dealing with homesickness, resolving conflict. They learn about developing skills, so they get a food handler's card. We do some assessment testing, like um, a, a, the TABE test, to measure their academic capabilities and, and understand how we get to support and serve them in their academic journey here. Once we finish the first two weeks, they have a much better handle on how fast we need to move, how quickly things need to happen in the day, and how little their time there is in between uh, mission events. They are well prepared at that point to begin school. In week three, they start going to school and uh, attend school Monday through Friday, and then Fridays and Saturdays, they attend uh, service to the community missions, and they've got to earn 50 hours to uh, qualify for the service to community core component requirement. Um, that being said, the day starts, every day starts at 0445 in the morning. They do physical fitness from 5 a.m. until 6 to 6.30, depending on how far they are in the cycle and their ability levels. Then they go back in, and in that next uh, hour and a half, uh, they are doing personal hygiene, cleaning their house, doing common area details and things like that. We detach a small detail to go to KP and help with serving meals. And then 
We have accountability formations where we hoist the colors and pay our respects to the, the state of Washington and to the United States of America. We have accountability, and it is a very ceremonial tradition that's important to our daily training schedule here. Then at 8.30, they are ready to go to school, and they are sitting ready to go. And here at the Youth Academy, there are no distractions. They don't have cell phones. They don't have internet. They don't have the things that create noise in their lives that distract them from what they really need to do. And that's part of why our program is so successful. We free up all of the other things that they used to spend time thinking about by doing them with such efficiency and attention to detail that it becomes automatic. And so now they're free by virtue of habit to focus on the things that they really need to. They're much more self-aware because they're less distracted. And as a result, they take great strides towards self-improvement. They have lunch every day at 11 o'clock. They have 20 minutes to eat and every one of their meals here is a silent meal. They don't talk. We're, we're there to eat and get on to the next thing. We're back in the classroom at 12 o'clock or training at 12 o'clock and we do that until 4 p.m. when we meet again in the afternoon for another accountability formation and we strike the colors for the day paying respects along the way. After dinner at 5 o'clock we continue on with more training. We have a training slot between 6 and 7 p.m sometimes 7.30, at which point we break for a snack, and then between 7.30 and 8.45, that is the time to uh, read mail, clean the house once again, take care of some personal things, reflection time. We really prioritize decompression and reflection time, read their letters, write letters home, and then we want to have some quiet reflection time, 10, 15 minutes before we turn the lights out. And they get eight hours uninterrupted every single night. That is a gift. It is. That is a very much a gift for a lot of students. So uh, some of our listeners are uh, students. And some of them, they may be interested in possibly joining the Washington Youth Challenge Academy. What advice would you give to a prospective student? Well, that's a great question, and I'm glad that you asked it because we do recognize that, that there's a lot of kids that are paying attention to what this mission is about, what we are about. I want to make sure everybody clearly understands that it might seem like a shortcut, but it's not. It is not a shortcut. Eight credits are great, and yes, in terms of time spent, they can be earned more quickly than you might be able to earn them in a traditional school setting or even online. But they're still high school classes and the work still has to be done. And here at the Youth Academy, there's a whole bunch of other things that have to be done in a longer period of time with far less control and privileges than they might be used to. So it's important, I, I point that out because it's important for the students that are interested to attend that A, they're not trying just to get a shortcut because nothing comes for free and nothing that's important in life should be given, it should be earned. Number two, they really need to be ready to put in the work and volunteer and commit to the process and not show up just to try out because the program only has so many seats to offer. I wish we had more and we're really trying to promote uh, awareness so that we can uh, expand and so the listeners out here out in the, the community I encourage you if you want to see more option opportunities like the Youth Academy affords young people as an alternative to to getting back on track to high school to graduate high school on time talk to your legislators and and tell them we need a program 30 percent and growing come from across the the mountains in eastern Washington and in the winter that's very difficult we want to expand our capability that being said we have 165 beds here in Bremerton and we have you know, in upwards of, of four to 500 applications for every class. So be serious and don't take the spot that somebody else needs as badly as you do. Be serious about what you want by being honest about what you're prepared to do to get it. You can't have something you're not willing to earn. Life, 
lessons are important and self-discipline and self-control are very common reasons why kids are not doing well in high school. You can't expect something for nothing. And you got to be willing to own and take responsibility for why the work isn't getting done. And we can blame a lot of situations, but at the end of the day, it is ourselves who are the common denominator in, in each of those situations. And we're empowered to make choices. And we're free to make them, but we're not free of the consequences of those choices. So it's time to make a commitment to yourself and committing to what the Youth Academy can offer you, and it'll be the best decision you ever made, I promise. Awesome, awesome. Now, I do have some adults that also listen to the <clears throat> podcast as well. Um, if some adults were possibly interested in working at the Washington Youth Academy, what would you tell them? Well, I would say this. Uh, when it comes to the uniform staff, uh, that's 24-7 kind of work, so it's shift work. It's not for everybody. I don't have weekends off, and I don't have you know, I, I can't regulate your schedule like you might be used to in a, in a traditional work environment. Also, we're working with teenagers, some of whom are lacking in structure and in need of some guidance, and it gets messy. And if you're not here to, if you're not interested to work with, with young people and roll your sleeves up and get in, in there where the mess is, then perhaps this work is, is not for you. Um, it is highly rewarding. It is challenging. It drains the body emotionally on certain days, but it feeds the soul in a way that I can't even begin to, to express. It's a wonderful place to work. Just need to know we're serving youth and helping them through right relationships. So we're not here to tell kids what to do, and, and if you don't possess... A, a wealth of compassion and desire to give back to your community, then this place isn't for you. There are also positions outside of the uniformed staff in the form of case managers, counselors, health center staff, dining facility, uh, food service staff, and they're all important. And uh, the Youth Academy positions are published on the state employment website, which is careers.wa.gov, and search Youth Academy, and whatever positions are open can be shown there. I know one thing you've mentioned, and it's awesome, you said this is definitely the, uh, it's feeding your soul, and just working here is fed your soul, and you also mentioned working at the academy can be draining. I was wondering, Commandant, uh, for you, uh, what are the challenges you face between balancing the professional life and your personal life? It's difficult. I, I, I have to be perfectly honest. I'm so committed to the work I do. And again, I'm so blessed that I'm doing something that I love that I don't really regard this as work. And so I, I don't dread coming to work. Some days are harder than others, for sure. I stay up at night sometimes thinking about a situation because we're in the people business. I love this work. And for me, I need to be better at balancing my, my personal lives. I have children, and I'm working on doing that and making sure that they get, get as much of my time and attention, and I'm getting as much of my own time and attention as, as I can. Um, but for me, I just love it so much, it's really hard to do that. I would tell other folks, maybe my example isn't the best one. I'm very committed to what I do, again, um, Having a good, healthy balance, work and, and home life is really important, and it allows for your relationships to, to thrive and flourish, and state employment offers benefits that make that you know, easier to do, to have time off that's paid and sick leave and, uh, and, and all of those benefits. It's wonderful. Um, can you tell me about a time um, working here at the Academy? And I'm, I'm sure there's a bunch, but can you think of maybe a case or two where – Man, there's a situation here that really touched your heart, that really moved you, and that it was just probably one, some of your most memorable experiences working with a kid. Oh, there's so many, and, and, I, and I knew you were going to ask me this question, and, and I, it's, it's like I, I struggle to come up with a name and a, and a face. There are just so many, but the faces, their faces when they walk across the stage, when they have reached that 
milestone, that achievement. And for many of them, that's the first real big win they've had in their, in their teenage lives. And they say things to us with the most sincere gratitude. Thank you for not giving up on me. Thank you for saving my life. And sometimes they, that takes a, a while, a year, two, three, four years. I think of a young man that I met in 2009 and he was really tough to work with. He really tested our boundaries and, and he tested our patients and I, I wasn't always sure that I was reaching him. I, I kept trying to instill upon him the importance of integrity and personal honor and and I think that I succeeded in sort of wearing down what he thought it should be and what we know in society, what we what we all want to aspire to in terms of self discipline, self love honor and integrity and serving your fellow man. And I think it worked out because uh, while we had a lot of conflict along the way, he did eventually graduate the program. And he called me up like three or four years later on New Year's Eve, right? And this young man had a background. He was on the streets. Uh, I think in the, at that time in his life, he was involved in some gang activities and just doing some, some risky kinds of things, all right? So for him to call me on New Year's Eve, sober as a judge, grateful and humble, and, and say, I just wanted to thank you for staying with me and helping me get the training that I needed, saving me from myself, not giving up on me, and, I, and he told me about he had settled down, he owned a house, he, you know, he was just taking all the right steps forward and to reach out and show gratitude, you know, and uh, of all nights on New Year's Eve, and I am home, I'm not doing anything on New Year's Eve, for him to do that, really, that, that was such a selfless act and such a, a, a sincere act of gratitude, that's so rewarding, right? The guy that maybe is the most at risk among the cadets in residence at the time found that peace and found that understanding. His light clicked on and he knew what brought that about and that was us. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. If you could turn back time, so let's just say this program, if this ex it existed back in the when you're 18, I guess my question is now, what would you tell your 18-year-old self if you could turn back time? Because we're talking about youth. I just kind of wonder with you. Well, first of all, I, I mean, I don't know if I were 18 in this day and age, and I'm 57. So when I was 18, it was the 80s, and it was awesome. But we didn't have all the technology and all these distractions. It was really... And at the time, you know, I thought we were, you know, it was, it was it. But now it's really tough on kids. I did know that I needed structure. I knew it so clearly that I joined the military. And so now what I would do, what I would say to myself, if I had it to do over again, I would say, don't have fear about the freedom that college right out of high school would have provided. I was afraid I couldn't control myself and I committed to the military where I felt like I needed a little bit more of a visible boundary for myself. And I don't think I gave myself enough credit because I thrived in the discipline and structure, but I was quickly on my own to make my own decisions and I realized pretty quickly that it was my own values and character that kept me on the straight and narrow. The military unlocked my discipline to get the work done before I started playing, and it took me a little while to master that, but it was never an ability that I lacked. It was an awareness, and I didn't challenge myself like I think I should have, so I'd go back and try that differently. 
Awesome. Awesome. Okay, so the last part of this interview, it's uh, called word association. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'll share a word or two, a phrase, and then uh, you can tell me your first thought. Now, the listeners know this, how much I really hate pickles, and I'm going to start with the first word. Uh, what is the first thing that comes to mind when you think of the word uh, pickles? Garden. And I say that because we have a garden here at the academy, and I love that we have it, and I want to learn all about gardening, and I love pickles. I don't know. What's wrong, Anthony, why you don't like pickles? No. They're awesome. I want no. to make them. I want to grow food and be more self-sustaining as a, as a member of my community. So, garden. Okay. Okay. Uh, romantic movies. Well... I will have to say, The Princess Bride is the movie that comes to mind, and that's just an awesome movie. And um, there's a few that I like. I really don't like to cry in a movie or have my emotions tugged at, so I, I try to be careful with that. So the word that comes to mind, romantic movies, Kleenex. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Taylor Swift. Traffic Jams. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I would just rather listen to good music on Spotify. Uh, you're gonna like you're gonna like this next one. Rap music. Eighties West Coast hip hop. Okay. I'm a California born and raised, and I love good rap music from the eighties. Uh, let's see. How about country music? I like some of that too. Um, cowboy hat and. Not a huge fan of country music, but I, I like all kinds of music. So, okay. yeah. Importance of hygiene. Well, I think I remember hearing one of the former Hall of Fame NFL players, Deion Sanders, who's now, I think, the coach at the head football coach at, at the University of Colorado. I don't know if he coined the phrase, but he sure says it a lot, and I've always kind of liked it. I uh, made me chuckle too. Look good, feel good, feel good, play good, play good, pay good. <laughs> so, like personal hygiene is important. We always want to look and feel our best. Starts with good routine, good hygiene, good self care. Okay. Uh, how about horror slasher gore movies? I don't go for those. I can't say I've never enjoyed. A, a kind of a slasher gory movie there's a couple sci-fi movies that are horror like aliens that i i think are classic and they're really good but i generally don't go for horror movies okay uh video games well i do like a video game now and again i have three children and they like to play video games and so i do like to know what they like to do and do that with them so I like to play Halo, and that's kind of an old game now, but that first-person shooter kind of game is fun. And I do like open-world games now as I'm a little older and just to explore. So, yeah, I'm an Xbox guy, and I like to play open-world games. Nice. How about racism? Racism has no place in our world, and the measure of a person is, is based on their efforts, their heart, and their character. And I want to do all I can to stomp that out. Racism has no place in our society. Sexism. Same, right? A person's abilities are their abilities. Whatever a person chooses to do and chooses to master, more importantly, is, is how somebody's merit should be measured. Okay. Sexism doesn't have a place. Pizza. Pizza. Thin crust, New York style, all day long. Traditional. Margarita pizza. Mm, mm, that sounds good. Good stuff. Good stuff. How about social media? You know, I, I must confess, I'm... I participate in social media both personally and professionally. I'm not an Instagram person. I'm not a, a Snapchat person. I do use Facebook. I'm a little older. I know that's sort of antiquated social media platform. 
I use Facebook professionally to communicate with our families when the kids are here. I'm more of a, a looker, not a, not a content provider. Um, but I will tell you, speaking as the commandant, I do believe social media, as much as it affords us m- many conveniences, social media is robbing our young people, even ourselves, from our own imaginations because we're, we're feeding off of other people's uh, ideas and thoughts. Some of that could be used against us as well. Um, so I just think overall, social media has consumed more of our consciousness than I, I think it should. Um, I'm not a huge participant. And like any of the other conveniences that we enjoy, like cell phones, we basically have pocket-sized computers that are very powerful. Um, it's taken away from the human social aspect that, that we're, we're I, I think, is directly correlating to the tensions that we experience. We're, we're not looking each other in the eye anymore. We're not saying what we need to say with restraint and respect. We're saying things with impunity over the Internet. And we've got to get back to looking each other in the eye, and I think social media is a barrier for that. Well said. Well said. Okay, uh, last thing is, uh, any final things you would like to tell our listeners? Well, it's a privilege to serve the youth and and the, the people of the state of Washington, and I'm grateful for this opportunity to do this work we do and grateful for the men and women I work with here at the Academy. Uh, I intend to do this work in as long as I'm able. And for those of you out there interested to support the Academy and its expansion, I encourage you to learn all about our mission. And, and if you think there ought to be a greater presence, a greater expanded role of the Youth Academy serving the thousands, tens of thousands of at-risk uh, teenagers who need our assistance, who can't make it on their own in traditional high schools, reach out to your legislators and, and make that known. Awesome. Thank you so much, Commandant, for your time. My pleasure, Anthony. Thank you. And that concludes this edition of Conversations with Mr. A. Uh, the one word I can think about when interviewing uh, Commandant Chris Acuna uh, from the Washington Youth Challenge Academy is just passion. So passionate about his job. And a lot of you guys, I've told uh, some of you guys this already, but um, I worked at the Washington Youth Academy and worked with Commandant uh, from 2011 to 2017. And I can tell you, gosh, in my entire school counseling career, it was just, that was just some of the most fun, awesome times. And it's just it's definitely rewarding. And so... I was there for six years, and I can just I can definitely tell you that uh, in my heart, the Washington Youth Academy will always, always, always have a special place in my heart. Now, if you go back to ev- uh, episode 17 with um, Gerald Lindsay, I had interviewed him right after I surprised him with his diploma and right after he finished the Washington Youth Academy at the residential phase, and that was a huge highlight as well. So thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. Stay tuned for more future episodes. Take care.